Hey, good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar entitled Avian, Swine, Equine, and Canine Influenza Viruses, What Do We Know About the Risks of Human Infections? with our presenter, Dr. Gregory Gray. Dr. Gray is a professor and infectious disease epidemiologist with research interests in zoonotic pathogens, especially respiratory viruses. He currently manages laboratory teams at Duke University, Duke Kushin University in China, and Duke NUS Medical School. In Singapore. All views and opinions expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect those of the American College of Veterinary Preventive Medicine. Following the presentation, Dr. Gray will be available to answer questions. If you have questions, please submit them by typing them in the chat or question boxes in the webinar platform. Audience lines will remain muted throughout the entirety of the presentation, and I'll provide Dr. Gray with your questions as time allows following the presentation. With that, Dr. Gray, you have the floor. Thank you, Dr. Doyle. Yeah, it's a pleasure to do this, and um, uh, thanks for all of you who have uh, joined us through the webinar. Today, in addition to uh, avian swine, equine, and canine, I thought I would also mention uh, feline influenza viruses. What we'll try to do today is give a quick overview of influenza viruses in general, and then chiefly focus on influenza A. We'll talk about what we know um, about the viruses that are reservoired in pigs, avian species, horses, dogs, and cats, and then wrap up with some of my own personal conclusions. First, let me just uh, say that we've uh, recently discovered uh, more information regarding influenza virus with the influenza D uh, uh, discoveries in 2011. Uh, th these uh, family of viruses uh, differs uh, from influenza A and B uh, in the number of genome segments. And we really, um, like influenza C, don't have an effective uh, antiviral treatment or vaccines and frequently diagnostics, at least in the healthcare settings for humans or animals, uh, would uh, miss these, these uh, viruses. Uh, Dr. Emily Bailey and our group is and colleagues have recently reviewed uh, some of these viruses in this uh, paper. It's uh, online if, you, if you're interested in more. Today I'm gonna focus chiefly on influenza A because it's the influenza A viruses that cause much of the morbidity uh, in both animals and man. Currently, there are now uh, 18 recognized hemagglutinin uh, types of influenza A and 11 neuraminidase uh, types. These two glycoproteins are what our immune system sees most often. And the viruses are also uh, unique in that they have a segmented genome. So if you get two or more viruses that enter the same cell, sometimes these viruses can exchange genetic part, particles and uh, out would come a progeny virus that would be a, some sort of combination of both. This is a nice slide uh, given to us by uh, colleagues at the USCDC uh, showing where these uh, various different hemagglutinin and neuraminidase types are reservoir. You'll note that um, we're, we've recently seen uh, H17, H18, N10, and N11 uh, in bats, and I understand there may be some more that are being vetted uh, that are reservoir in bats. So there's quite a variety of viruses out there. Uh, some are chiefly re reservoir in aquatic birds, uh, some are reservoir in man, and some uh, in uh, pigs. It's good for me to refresh uh, a little epi about these influenza A viruses. In humans, um, we know people can be infectious before they, they develop signs or symptoms, uh, and they can shed virus several days after they've uh, recovered uh, from infection. So that's why we have, uh, in many healthcare facilities like here, ours here at Duke, uh, requirements for receiving the seasonal influenza vaccine, such that we don't have uh, nosocomial transmission. Children in the immunocompromised can shed virus uh, for longer periods of time. And so particularly we need to be, we need to be concerned about 
uh, their uh, opportunities to spread the viruses. And viruses can be uh, found to live on non-porous surfaces in some experimental studies up to seven days. Influenza A viruses in the environment have also been uh, found to have a, a long uh, lifespan, if you will. Uh, here are a number of different references uh, showing that uh, we can detect and, and uh, culture out live viruses from water up to 100 days, uh, manure up to 105 days. And so it's a real difficulty for our colleagues in, uh, for instance, uh, poultry uh, veterinary medicine, when you have a contamination with an avian influenza virus, uh, to um, rid the, uh, the barns uh, of those viruses is, is quite challenging. Again, in review, influenza A viruses uh, cause uh, epidemics frequently in humans and animals. And when we see big changes in the chief uh, immunolog the immune uh, glycoproteins, uh, then we can have uh, even larger um, outbreaks. And if it's a worldwide outbreak, of course, a pandemic, and that's frequently noted when we have an antigenic shift. But frequently we see antigenic drift or small changes through uh, recombination or mutations uh, very frequently. And we must keep close monitoring of those uh, viruses for these changes. There's a lot of work that goes on in, in monitoring and deciding what uh, viral constructs to put in vaccines for both humans and animals. This is a nice little graphic um, uh, put out by Dr. Uh, Ma and our collaborators in, in China, showing that there are plenty of opportunities for these viruses to mix. Viruses that might be reservoired in humans or avian species or pigs, um, all they basically need is a competent host uh, where two or more viruses can uh, gain entry into the cell, exchange materials, and then through, for instance, in a, in a facility where you have different species in contact with each other, humans, pigs, for instance, poultry, uh, dogs, and then we have opportunity to move the viruses back and forth between species. And sometimes we see the viruses that are sustained in the environment. With all this uh, thought about the close um, exchange of viruses between uh, humans and animals, it's good for us to think about production of um, livestock. And if you look at these projections, uh, two of the key reservoirs with respect to threats to man for influenza A are pigs and uh, chickens. And the projections are such that we're going to continue uh, to grow uh, these livestock populations around the world to feed the growing human population. So we really need to partner with our veterinary friends um, in, uh, in ascertaining the, the threats, uh, both in uh, humans and in animals. That, um, that could be generated from the enzootic, if you will, and endemic viruses. Well, let's first talk about influenza A viruses in pigs. Um, pig production uh, is uh, uh, rapidly moving to uh, uh, modern uh, livestock, uh, more efficient, um, less costly production schemes. And much of that technology comes from our, our veterinary world, uh, who, is, uh, who have um, pioneered a lot of these uh, different uh, advantages in, in uh, livestock production. And China certainly is taking advantage of this. Uh, we're conducting studies in China, and we're observing rapid changes in their animal husbandry from pigs. Uh, their hope is to continue to grow in pig production. Uh, they're reducing uh, the numbers of small and medium-sized um, pork uh, farms in an attempt to not only continue to feed their population, but eventually be an exporter of pork. So you can see the, the very large uh, pork production going on in China. And uh, China um, has, of course, been very ambitious and wanting to gain um, new technologies in recently purchasing purchasing the leading producer in the United States, Smithfield Farms, and then talking about mega farms uh, that they're developing, for instance, in the north near Siberia, 
with the idea that they could, for instance, feed uh, uh, thousands of people in, uh, in high economic areas like Singapore uh, through their um, domestic production. Well, we know uh, largely due to our colleagues in veterinary medicine quite a bit about swine influenza viruses uh, in uh, the industry, the pork industry, and um, there are a number of papers uh, cited here, but in general, where you have a lot of pigs and they're densely uh, in the pig farms, uh, and you have um, sometimes the exchange of, uh, of pigs, uh, but not necessarily required, uh, you have a lot of viruses that are enzootic. And this is frequently because in large pig populations, you have a continual turnover of immunologically naive animals that can um, be a, a way to sustain the viruses. We also know that influenza A viruses have been associated uh, with a number of pandemics. Um, in 1918, there were concomitant um, epi epizootics in uh, pigs. At the same time, there were epidemics in man. It's hard to know uh, where the origins of that virus began. But we definitely have uh, strongly implicated uh, 1957, 1968, and in 2009, uh, swine, uh, swine domestic uh, stocks as associated with human pandemics. So uh, we need to be thinking about what's going on in pigs. And often pigs don't have severe signs or symptoms. And so the influenza A viruses can be viewed as uh, not that critical. It doesn't greatly uh, uh, reduce uh, production. Uh, so uh, the industry wonders, well, you know, why should we uh, be so concerned about it? But one of the reasons to be concerned is that there seems to be very clear evidence that um, uh, swine workers uh, are at increased risk of infection from their occupational exposures. This is um, a paper we published some time ago uh, looking at uh, swine farms, uh, swine workers in the state of uh, Iowa. And you can see here for the classical swine H1N1, we have very high odds ratios of elevated uh, antibodies against uh, that for both the swine workers and for their often spouses who never worked in swine uh, production. We found this not only for the classical H1N1 that's probably been there since first detections in the 1930s, but also for swine H1N2, which at that time had been recently emergent in about three years. So compared to people without swine exposure, both the workers and their spouses were at increased risk, which suggests that there's a lot of transmission going on uh, in the farms, uh, pigs to humans, and now later we, uh, I'm sorry, uh, pigs to humans later we know, vice versa, humans to pigs. And then somehow the workers are bringing the virus home, either as fomites in their clothing or shoes, or perhaps uh, as a respiratory infection. We don't really know that well. However, we do know that some of the behaviors associated with the industries have um, certainly contributed to the spread of novel viruses uh, in uh, North America. This is, these are two very nice papers by Martha Nelson uh, formerly of the, uh, or of the NIH, uh, Fogarty International Center. Um, Martha is a modeler and looking at unique uh, genetic um, fingerprints she was able, that were often captured by veterinary diagnostic labs uh, and influenza A isolates, she was able to track this movement. So the way we do husbandry uh, contributes to the spread of influenza A viruses. Well, we've been privileged to work closely with leading researchers in China, Dr. Wu Chang Chao at the Beijing Institute of Microbiology and Epidemiology. In an NIH R01 funded study, we're in our fifth year. This is a one health study where we're looking at pig workers, 300 and then 100 non-exposed uh, workers of roughly the same age. We're following them closely for influenza-like illness and we're uh, collecting serum from them uh, every year. We're also sampling um, uh, pigs, uh, some 50 pens uh, for every one of our six farms in two provinces in China uh, through oral secretions, trying to get a handle on the types of viruses that are circulating in them. 
And finally, we're looking in the environment with the 144 aerosol, fecal, environmental swabs, and water samples per month. It's a lot of work, and we couldn't do this without our partners in China, who were frankly doing a, a, a lot of the sampling. Uh, this is a partnership with a number of CDCs in China uh, in, in these two provinces. I'll just summarize the work. It's rather complicated, uh, but we've seen tremendous evidence of, of uh, sharing of viruses uh, from uh, pigs to man and from man to pigs and to animals that are uh, also quell and uh, co-inhabiting uh, co in these farms. So it seems like the, um, the hypotheses for these mixing, uh, uh, swine influenza virus mixing in, in uh, pig farms in China is, is a very real thing. We observed uh, in our six farms uh, rather poor biosecurity uh, with uh, ducks and geese being pinned up in between uh, pig barns with open windows, um, uh, very little rodent control, very little fly control. And so very easy for uh, rodents and uh, insects to move pathogens around uh, between uh, the ducks and the chickens, sometimes free, free ranging in the pig facilities, uh, between the dogs that are standing guard. And, and that coupled with people that aren't uh, frequently are not wearing personal protective gear is a real setup for a movement of uh, viruses across uh, species. Well, it's not just, uh, you know, pig farms uh, that we think are contributing to the mixing of viruses. Uh, in our own country, uh, there have been multiple observations, particularly the CDCs, that um, sometimes uh, this uh, this uh, thing we do uh, in the state and the county fairs, this rich tradition, um, has contributed to the movement of uh, viruses between species. And we were very fortunate to partner with our colleagues at the CDC and the University of Minnesota uh, some years ago in studying uh, uh, swine shows and uh, found uh, uh, the first year was frankly quite boring because in studying the pigs, we found uh, very little activity influenza, but the second uh, year we found uh, quite a few, five months um, after the pandemic H1N1 broke out, we found evidence that it had already moved to the pigs, and this was validated by multiple researchers in multiple countries. So that H1N1 2009 pandemic virus had a very low threshold for cross-species infection. And subsequent to these uh, moving these viruses, into the pig facilities and their amplification, they have generated progeny viruses, uh, results of the um, combinations, re the reassortments, the recombinations from viruses that were already in Zutik and pigs, out have been coming novel viruses associated with um, large pig farming. Uh, these kind of, um, uh, observations uh, have continued. There's been some wonderful work at Ohio State by Andy Bowman, who has a large uh, surveillance network in the, uh, the state uh, and county fairs. And he's come up with some just amazing statistics that uh, are, you know, are hard to believe somewhat in that uh, the entry of uh, healthy pigs that are screened by veterinarians, uh, perhaps a pig or two carrying an influenza A virus, uh, at the beginning of a swine show, uh, several days later, as many as 77% of the pigs uh, are found to be uh, infected or to be carrying influenza A. So tremendous opportunity for uh, amplification in the swine show. And then we have seen quite a few infections in humans. Sometimes they're only casually going into the uh, swine barn to look at the animals uh, suspecting the aerosol and direct contact is transmitting the virus, the viruses to humans. Well, we've also observed, this is a, a very nice paper by Amy Vincent and, uh, uh, and, and colleagues uh, in uh, various other institutions, showing over time that the various influenza A viruses that have um, entered into pigs, you'll see in this nice graphic, they documented human viruses moving into pigs and aquatic bird viruses moving into pigs. 
And so now at the time of this paper, which was 2008 publication, uh, and these authors reported six different main types of viruses circulating in pigs. Well, now since the pandemic viruses have become exotic in pigs, there are more uh, different uh, types of viruses circulating, some of which have um, viral components from those um, human pandemic uh, viruses. So in this uh, uh, subsequent report, they noted 10 different unique H1 and H3 subtypes circulating in US Midwestern farms. But not to be outdone, in the UK, they even have more variants. In fact, in this paper published in 2015, they reported 23 unique genotypes circulating. This is by looking at the uh, uh, individual gene segments and, and classifying them uh, based on their genetic sequence. So a lot of variants now uh, circulating with many of them H1N1 2009 pandemic virus uh, components. In China, the situation is even more astounding. Uh, this is, these are unpublished data uh, from colleagues uh, Maria Houchen Zhu in Hong Kong, and they're rather passive surveillance um, that involve basically um, uh, swapping pigs when they go to market, uh, they have found quite a few variants of influenza A. Uh, and some of these are more prevalent than others. They call them persistent types. So I guess I just wanted to illustrate this. It's not often thought about, but so to me, uh, mathematically, it makes sense that if you have more variants of virus, in a uh, population that could generate novel viruses, the probability of generating a novel virus that could cause, uh, for instance, a pandemic would be higher. And yet we don't have a lot of aggressive uh, surveillance in these populations. Much of the surveillance is passive and it has to do with when an animals become, enough animals become sick enough to call a veterinarian in, and the veterinarian calls for a culture and sends it to a laboratory. So in contrast to poultry production, at least in the United States, where monitoring of avian or of influenza A is closely prescribed and required, we just don't have a good handle on what's going on, I would argue, in the swine populations. Uh, I know there's, there's some cooperation with the US CDC, um, but it, it's, it's not the magnitude, I think, that would give us a really good handle and early warning of a virus that perhaps uh, would infect pigs and, and not um, cause serious illness, uh, but yet be th a threat to man. So I've, we've argued in various different uh, editorials that, you know, despite our knowledge of how rapidly the pandemic virus spread and was perhaps amplified in swine populations, we still don't have a, a good clear view of the ecology of uh, influenza A viruses uh, in pigs. And it's rather tragic that we, to get the, um, the attention of this, you know, humans have to suffer. We have to see a significant number of humans before we go in and, and uh, do an evaluation of what might be causing an illness in that human outbreak uh, that might, might be uh, deriving its origin or might have origins in pigs. So let me just sort of wrap up the pig section uh, and say that available data suggests that influenza A viruses in pigs may move back and forth between humans and pigs, and often these infections in both are subclinical. Modern influenza A strains, which are reservoir in pigs, occasionally cause outbreaks and severe disease in humans. Uh, but, uh, you know, in general, we're, we, don't, we just don't have uh, the severity of illness, as we'll see with some of the other strains reservoir in other animals. Historically, influenza A viruses circling in pigs have been associated with four recent pandemics and have great potential to play a role in generating future uh, pandemic strains. Let's chat a bit about influenza A viruses. Um, we know, I think, uh, quite a bit about these. So they've, we, we know, for instance, that uh, quite a few uh, H7, H5 uh, strains have caused severe disease in humans. Uh, however, some of these uh, can uh, be very, very mild. Uh, we know uh, that the risk to, um, you, uh, to humans, and at least as a, determined by experts in public health, 
uh, is thought to be relatively low. But once a person is infected, uh, often those people have uh, severe disease. And then, of course, China is one of the few countries uh, that is considered epi epidemic or epizootic uh, for some of the most disconcerting strains, the highest priority strains for colleagues at CDC, H7N9 and H5N1. Uh, and most recently, China has uh, instigated compulsory vaccinations against those strains in the bivalent vaccine. So we'll talk a bit about that. I would just say that, and my gestalt on this through ours and other epidemiologic, uh, serologic studies, is that these infections occur in man, uh, and particularly those that are uh, exposed to ill ill birds or dead birds, uh, but they're generally pretty rare, um, and often they're they're subclinical. Uh, this is based on you know op epidemiological odds ratio studies of uh, serology, um, and we can identify risk factors for this. In fact, there's been quite a few papers along the line. This is our paper, but many different papers. Our colleagues in um, the Netherlands have uh, developed this very outstanding report of uh, the various different uh, epidemiological studies of animal uh, influenza A viruses. I'll, I'll call your attention to it. And I know this is going to be really small on this screen, um, but just to show you the number of studies and how they rank them, I'm illustrating this one graphic. Um, papers that they thought were really well done uh, generally have come later as we develop better techniques and become more uh, clever with respect to ascertaining um, serologic evidence of infection. But you can see that there are quite a few studies there um, for various different uh, swine and avian types. And just to sort of pull their, their summary statement out and point to it, I think it's worth sort of reviewing some of their texts. They say that swine to human in transmission is prevalent, but national swine surveillance uh, is, is pretty darn weak, uh, and uh, we need to do better. They also talk about the surveillance uh, is pretty good for H5 and H7 among uh, birds. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, that is, uh, is uh, suboptimal because we need surveillance for other uh, hemagglutinin types as well. This is a nice paper uh, by our colleague uh, in, in Beijing, Meijia uh, Ma, who followed a cohort of some of the most intensely exposed workers in China uh, who were exposed uh, to recent generations of H7 and 9, H9 and 2, and H5 and 1 strains. And I think it's remarkable for the relative low zero um, conversions that they detected in these workers. So despite very intense exposures, uh, they're really seeing, you know, an incidence of zero conversion 1.27 per thousand persons per year. Uh, for H7 and 9, 8.2 people for H9 and 2, H5 and 1. So in contrast to the pig workers who will receive much higher evidence of infection by odds ratios and serial conversions uh, based on uh, one-time serology and paired serology, uh, the, the, the poultry workers just aren't having the same uh, tremendous risk. And yet we know from various different epidemiological studies these um, uh, markets that Dr. Ma studied are really a hotspot for human uh, animal to human transmission, particularly when there's a lot of different animals and there are different species of animals in there. And, uh, the sanitation is poor and perhaps the animals are kept a long time. So it's a quite an interesting phenomenon in China and other developing countries, these live animal markets. And they've been implicated uh, recently and a human transmission of uh, H7N9 viruses. And we don't have time to go into this in great de uh, detail, but I know that um, there have been at least uh, five waves and we're now would, would be under the sixth wave with the fifth wave uh, showing some evidence of severe illness in, in the birds with hot pathogenic strains uh, and increased numbers of cases. But in uh, mid 2017, uh, China introduced uh, vaccines, and they also re uh, closed a lot of these markets in the big cities 
Um, and that seems to have a tremendous uh, impact in reducing the risk of man and reducing the prevalence of H7 and 9 and we think H5 uh, in the birds. And I'll just leave you with this paper and this sort of summary at the top here of 92% uh, reduction uh, in, in human cases, 98 uh, human uh, H5 and in 98 reduction in H7 uh, cases. So pretty interesting. The vaccines uh, seem to be working, at least for now, in China. So let me sort of wrap up what we could, you can spend weeks on. Occasionally, the avian influenza viruses uh, infect humans, but human influenza viruses are not known to go back into the avian species. This is in contrast that human viruses easily go back into pigs and, and into dogs. When uh, human avian influenza virus infections are detected, often they reflect severe disease. So the case fatality is much higher for these, yet they're inf more infrequent. And I would say that the avian influenza viruses have great potential or potential uh, to play a, generating, uh, a role in generating novel strains and that might lead to pandemics. Let's shift to equine influenza. Uh, this is the second most important respiratory tract disease in horses. We know that uh, before vaccines, epizootics were quite uh, common. Uh, the mortality could be high, as much as 20% in horses. And in the last 20 or 30 years, we've had just chiefly one type, H3 and 8 strains. But the epizootics in animals and countries that have a lot of horses that are close together has been pretty uh, amazing. Uh, you can see in these figures the horse deaths, uh, 225,000 in the uh, 1980s in Mongolia, uh, had a big impact on their equine industries. And the impact was not just, um, you know, for, for labor or for meat. Uh, this is a very large uh, epizootic that occurred in Australia in 2007 that had a tremendous economic impact because it was associated uh, with horse racing. So these are not, uh, these epizootics are important uh, in multiple ways. And there's some, some curious data that colleagues have pointed out uh, in historic literature before we knew what influenza viruses were. Some observations that influenza, a respiratory illness that people recognized at the time, uh, was severe in men and horses in the 1600s, 1700s. Even dogs and cats were sometimes showing manifestations. And so up until recently, we didn't really understand how this could be true. Uh, we could see viruses uh, perhaps uh, moving back and forth between species. In the 1960s, there were some uh, uh, immunological studies or archaeoimmunologic studies where they took people who had uh, were generally older and based on their birth years, looked at the prevalence of uh, antibodies, neutralizing antibodies against H3 and 8, and noted uh, increased prevalence of neutralizing antibodies for those that lived in certain years. And it's been alleged that perhaps equine influenza viruses were a cause of human pandemics in the late 1800s. So an interesting thing, we haven't really seen evidence for this in recent years, but something to be concerned about. Well, some of our colleagues at the uh, NIH in the 1960s did some very interesting studies, uh, sometimes, most of the time in prisoners. Uh, they inoculated horses, uh, for instance, in this study with an H3 and 8 virus. It was passage to uh, a pony and then passage through man and found to be largely viable through passages back to a pony. In a similar fashion, passage to uh, through ponies uh, to man over on the right. The humans that were infected generally had a mild uh, elevation in, in ten temperature of any signs or symptoms at all and didn't feel it really bad. So sort of silent infections that might be taken as caused by another common cold virus is probably how uh, these viruses uh, move in man, at least in recent years. Uh, however, uh, one of our uh, students um, had did some pretty interesting work, uh, Carrie uh, Leedham Larson, uh, looking at evidence uh, that uh, uh, persons exposed to horses and occupational exposed had elevated antibodies. And 
um, you know, we, we seem to have some indication uh, that uh, they were at increased risk or in their occupations had been exposed, although it's really hard. We tried in a number of studies uh, to look for evidence of acute infection and really not found anything. So in, in this um, uh, review uh, by uh, Tai Ji from our group, uh, he looked at all the historical evidence of uh, equine influenza viruses causing infections in man. And in general, uh, it, it seems to occur, although generally it's, the risk is relatively uh, low and often humans uh, don't have a lot of signs or symptoms. Um, and generally we don't see severe disease in humans, at least it's never been reported of equine influenza virus severe disease that I know of. So we would say that like avian flu, uh, these viruses have potential to play a role in generating pandemic strains, um, contributing to pandemic in the future. Let's move to uh, influenza A in dogs. Uh, it was uh, in 2004 that University of Florida researchers noted the first H3N8 infections in dogs associated with greyhound uh, track uh, racing. Uh, the viruses uh, had relatively few changes from those that were circulating in horses. Uh, now it's thought that these uh, that dogs are readily infected with a number of different strains. And where you have dense populations of dogs, uh, then you can see sustained transmission and, gen and the generation of novel viruses. As far as we know, we have not seen canine influenza infections in man. Here's some studies, again, in the 60s and uh, uh, in the 1970s, where we challenged dogs uh, with various different influenza viruses and found that they could um, they could be infected, although in general they weren't uh, seriously ill. Now, a move to uh, recent years, we are seeing serious illnesses in dogs uh, due to, for instance, H5N1 viruses um, and then uh, other viruses that have has sustained transmission in dogs, sometimes originating, we think, in South Korea and perhaps in China. And so the dogs uh, in some settings have uh, amplified and, and maintained uh, viruses in their populations. Uh, this has been reviewed quite a bit in the literature um, and, and some interesting observations most recently of canines in Southern uh, China, various different strains with evidence that the viruses uh, readily can go uh, from humans to dogs. And it's no wonder perhaps that we see dogs uh, being infected with uh, avian viruses. This is photos down in uh, Guangdong where feral dogs uh, mix with uh, the various sellers of live animals and eating the carcasses that are discarded, uh, some of which probably are poultry carcasses with avian flu. Uh, so it's no wonder that dogs pick up uh, viruses from other species. Well, there's been quite a bit of literature on these, and this is a little uh, graphic of some of the things published on PubMed. But you can see the, a number of different hemagglutinin and neuraminidase types infecting dogs. These are some wonderful data from our, our, our colleague Colin Parrish Laboratory um, uh, at, at Cornell University. Colin has been monitoring uh, canine influenza for a number of years. He shared this uh, graphic with us, showing the, the increased number of cases among uh, the specimens that he's received uh, over time and their hotspots in the United States. I think his work is remarkable because it illustrates one thing that's very different about dogs uh, in comparison to, for instance, pigs and chickens. And that is that, um, as he summarized here, there's relatively poor transmissibility among dogs across a large metropolitan area. And he says it's really due to the, the populations not being really large, like in pig farming or in, in poultry uh, farming. And so there's a sort of a low level of activity going along, and then it, the virus will hit a, a larger population of dogs in the shelter, for instance, and they'll see a spike. But it's very different than the risk that we see, for instance, when you have a large facility of pigs or chickens and the virus can go in there and be amplified many times. So uh, Whitney uh, Kruger uh, did this uh, very nice study for her PhD um, at the uh, 
in our program at the University of Florida. She basically studied dog workers and controlled and involved serological assessments for a number of pathogens that included canine influenza. And again, using multiple tests, uh, found evidence that it was sort of borderline here with the neutralization uh, test that persons exposed to dogs um, might be at increased risk of uh, being infected and having silent infections. Well, we had to conclude that this was a negative study because the, the odds ratio um, did not uh, uh, exclude one, but nonetheless, uh, one wonders if these infections are uh, crossing over to man, perhaps a bigger study in the future with a greater variety of viruses that might be more telling. But for now, we have to say there's no evidence that canine influenza virus is infecting humans. So we sort of summarize it uh, right here that, um, uh, you know, the dogs can receive infections from a number of different uh, influenza a viruses, but we just don't, and we think they may play a role, but the risk demand seems um, quite small. Well, the cats too have been infected with influenza viruses. Uh, this was not recognized perhaps uh, 20 years ago, uh, but uh, now we've seen um, uh, canine influenza viruses jump to cats. Uh, we've seen um, uh, we, we've we've seen um, uh, Avian influenza viruses jump to cats. Uh, we, we're seeing uh, quite a few instances of this. It's not frequently sustained. It's sort of sporadic as well as that for uh, canine influenza. Um, but there are quite a few reports out there showing uh, that feline species are being infected. So again, uh, we think that there is some potential here that they could generate some component of pandemic strains but not thought to be you know, a big factor. Well, that brings me to sort of my uh, overall view of uh, various different uh, influenza A viruses that are uh, reservoir in, in domestic animals. I think there's a tremendous barrier between the viruses that circulate in dogs and cats, the barrier of the viruses going to humans. Uh, we just don't have uh, evidence for those viruses coming, uh, moving over to infect humans. Uh, so there's a, perhaps a lower barrier uh, for the viruses that circulate in um, equines. Um, but again, that seems to be a pretty good barrier with not a lot of at least overt disease. Poultry influenza viruses, again, don't affect, uh, infect man as readily perhaps as uh, one might be concerned about for other influenza viruses. But when they do, the people are do, they are detected, people often have severe disease. But where I think the, the action is, uh, where we see much more cross-species infections is uh, among pigs. And it's uh, rather tragic that we don't have better cooperation, uh, uh, collaboration um, between the veterinary and, and human and animal industries and looking for novel viruses in pigs. It's rather sporadic. And yet we know that um, Viruses associated with pigs have been implicated in four different pandemics. And finally, um, uh, you know, we, we, um, we, we know that there are unique viral strains out there, many of them, in contrast to the relatively few strains that circulate in horses or, or um, uh, dogs. There are plenty of viruses in the pigs that could uh, res generate a novel virus when, when the right situation is uh, present. Well, let me just jump in and wrap up with tell you that uh, in addition to influenza A, uh, I mentioned influenza B, influenza C, and influenza D also have, uh, there's evidence of animal infection, non-human animal infections. And it's again illustrated in this review article I talked about from uh, Dr. Bailey. I think it's appropriate to point out that both humans and pigs seem to be susceptible to at least some strains in all four of these influenza groups. And so, uh, you know, it really is important, I think, that we work um, with the pig industries, uh, with our veterinarians in the swine industry to keep a handle on what's, uh, what's circulating in pigs. And we work together in a One Health way 
uh, to try to improve our knowledge. I think it's important to point out that we're seeing some interesting increased occupational risk, at least in the one small study that we did, 88% of prevalence and uh, cattle with influenza D and neutralizing antibodies and a high proportion of cattle workers, in contrast, relatively low seroprevalence of neutralizing antibodies in humans not exposed to cattle. And then others have found very high prevalence in pigs. So we're still learning quite a bit about that. This is a nice uh, review article by Su Shua in China, uh, trying to sketch out what we think we know about influenza D viruses between um, uh, hosts. Well, let me just wrap up here and uh, say that, well, what do we know in general? What can we do about these things? Um, I think we've, we've learned quite a bit about uh, influenza virus threats to man. There's much more to learn. But one of the things that we, we could do that uh, would help both uh, the animal production industries and man was uh, make biosecurity training uh, compulsory and widely available for those in the industry. Uh, especially people that are in animal production and um, abattoir workers worldwide. Uh, and while we do this biosecurity, I think, pretty darn well here in the United States and perhaps in the EU, I've seen some really poor bad, um, really poor biosecurity in the developing world. Um, and so what we can do to help them along, I think, would be uh, very strategic. We need to try to promote modern meat processing techniques, those things that we've learned. Uh, in, for instance, in, in our land grant universities for many years, we need to transport that knowledge as best we can into the developing world, help them supplant, if you would, uh, live animal markets and market butchering, which can be a, a real threat for uh, humans uh, to be infected with influenza A viruses. We need to broker one health oriented novel virus surveillance with large swine and poultry farms and a large, large animal distribution centers. And we gotta do this in a way that does not threaten the industry. And uh, that's challenging. Uh, we need to find ways to do this better, to partner in a way that's mutually beneficial. And finally, I think there's some pretty exciting things we could do with respect to technology. We need, we need simple, robust virus sampling, detection, and characterization tools, perhaps uh, at the farm. Now we've had some pretty exciting things going on. We learned from our partners in engineering, for instance, with uh, aerosol sampling and novel virus, I thought I'd, uh, aerosol sampling and novel virus diagnostics. Let me share a little bit of that with you. We've worked closely with NIOSH in adapting uh, some of their samplers in various different environments and learned quite a bit about uh, virus, at least RNA and sometimes live virus circulating in the air. And so we can benefit from our partners in environmental sciences and uh, more work has actually been done. Um, partners in Minnesota, for instance, uh, in uh, the agricultural industries. But we can also apply these tools uh, and some of that work is, is quite remarkable in that as far as uh, 16 kilometers away in this review article by Dr. Ben Anderson, uh, uh, PEDV uh, uh, RNA was detected from an outbreak in a barn. So these surveillance tools are very sensitive and they can cover large areas and perhaps in a way uh, that we could have better efficiency in looking for novel virus emergence um, in, in the animal industries or, or the places where the animals uh, go to market. We brought these samplers in various different healthcare settings uh, in uh, schools um, in the uh, subway in Singapore and it's, it's been quite interesting uh, how, much, uh, how much virus is circulating in the air and, and sometimes our infection control uh, procedures in the hospitals are not working so well because the viruses are aerosolized. Uh, this is a remarkable paper, I think, and then our partners in uh, Hanoi area recently went to a large distribution center, poultry market, um, hundreds of stalls, and the aerosol samplers were positive for influenza A signals 90% of the time. So these workers have intense exposures. Um, you can see why. And their immune system is quite uh, probably tolerant from the, from the daily uh, inoculations with uh, 
antigen. But at any rate, uh, th this could be useful if you're looking for a new virus in a, in a large animal population like uh, these tens of thousands of birds. Finally, there's all kinds of new diagnostics uh, available. This is a, a pretty exciting uh, diagnostic that you know, has promise uh, to bring advanced diagnostics rapidly to the field. This is by Endeavor. It's a prototype, but basically uh, it can uh, characterize RNA uh, from influenza viruses uh, in eight hours instead of multiple iterations of real-time PCR and sequencing that can take uh, two weeks or more. So in the future, we're going to have uh, deep sequencing and this uh, that will help us detect. In fact, um, you might have seen this news release, the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub and Chan Zuckerberg Initiative are partnering with the Gates Foundation to try to put deep sequencers in many places of the world. And the information would go up in the cloud and be interpreted with very sophisticated ID seq software such they could uh, tell what was in a specimen with respect to viral families and even drill down to see what kind of virus uh, in one of those families uh, had been seen. So the future is bright. Uh, again, here are the sort of the final recommendations, and I thank everyone for uh, your attention today. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Um, we can now go and see if there's any questions. If you do have a question, please um, type it in the question tab um, as part of the GoToWebinar control panel, and we can get started. Um, we do have a question to start with. Um, the question is asking if you could rank the various animal host species in terms of their level of risk on humans, given what we know about the unique characteristics of the virus strains and the diversity in the level of exposures from these hosts to humans. This should be broader than what is currently published by the Dutch group by considering all other factors in addition to agent characteristics in their ranking. Well, I, uh, I'll have to say again that I think I'm most concerned about uh, the pig-human interaction. We, we have relatively uh, sparse surveillance uh, right now at that interface. And historically, uh, it's been an important interface for the emergence of uh, pandemic strains. And there's so many variants out there we, we know of in rather superficial uh, surveillance that could contribute to a novel virus generation. I'm more worried about that, frankly, than the viruses that are circulating in avian species. Now, this goes against um, our colleagues at the CDC who have prior prioritized the viruses on multiple characteristics and done so in a very defendable way. Um, and certainly we see high mortality uh, with um, particularly highly pathogenic H5 and, and uh, H7N9 viruses. So I'm, I'm probably in a minority with that position uh, that uh, swine viruses are in my mind more important and we need to do better in, in working with the swine industry and uh, swine veterinarians. Thank you. And then the next question is, can you comment on the positive and negative impact from the current outbreak with African swine fever in China on the SIV control efforts in the country? Well, I don't have, uh, you know, broad knowledge of um, either the uh, African swine fever or, or all the bi biosecurity measures that are being taken. I will say that we participated in a review article that's under uh, journal um, review uh, that, that suggests that um, uh, various things are contributing to uh, these, this sort of an outbreak, uh, the importation of uh, pork products, the importation of live animals, uh, the uh, uh, animal husbandry, uh, biosecurity problems, the movement of animals uh, in China. Uh, so it's a, it's a real concern to China and to the rest of the world. I mean, I, I, one of the state veterinarians I met recently in, in a big meeting, uh, uh, it's really shaking uh, you know, their confidence. They're saying it's African swine fever is, is going to hit us. There's too many ways it can come in, and we, we have to be ready. So, I mean, that's a real concern, particularly when you think, now this again is my veterinary colleagues tell me, uh, that we've suffered from the 
porcine epidemic diarrheal virus recently, 10% of piglets in the United States were killed. We know that there are highly virulent um, porcine reproductive respiratory syndrome viruses out there. Uh, fortunately, not all of those are here in the United States, but they could be. Uh, we, we know that there are a number of circle viruses circulating, porcine circle virus that could enter our herds. And so, uh, you know, China is something we have to, we have to keep, there's so many pigs in China and the mixture of the biosecurity uh, quality is, is great. It's, it's easy to envision more threats coming to the United States and other uh, large pork producing countries like Vietnam and uh, Germany. Thank you. Um, the next two questions I believe are related. Um, the first was, um, there was a report in 2016 about a cat to human influenza transmission from a flu outbreak in New York City in a shelter. Um, they're asking if this was accurate or if it had since been refuted, um, referencing a clinical infectious disease 2017 article. Um, and then the second question was if there's any theories on whether the New York City feeling outbreak was a detection event of virus circulating in the feline population or an avian spillover um, and asked if there were any known surveillance studies being conducted in cats. Well, I have to admit, I, I don't know that literature very well. I don't know that study, and I don't know what exactly is being done in cat surveillance. Um, Dr. Parrish would probably be a good one to chat with uh, to get a better handle on, on, uh, on that, as he has uh, closely been monitoring uh, the canine flu. Sorry, I don't, I can't answer that with those questions. Okay. Um, then there was a comment saying, it should be noted that USDA APHIS has a close working relationship with CDC and monitoring IAV in swine. Um, this USDA program and CDC collaboration has been ongoing since 2009. IAV in swine are collected H and N genes are sequenced, the selection of viruses, or whole genome is sequenced on a monthly basis. All sequences are deposited into GenBank and analyzed quarterly by USDA ARF um, by Dr. Amy Vincent. Um, and that information shows the CDC. So thank you for that comment. Yeah, let me, um, and we have got let me say something about oh, that. Please. I mean, while that's really true, um, I, I have heard that 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 surveillance is is uh, a lot of oftentimes uh, contingent upon animals being sick uh, and what is ordered uh, for instance at the, at the local veterinary diagnostic lab and so i would argue that that's again quite different than the poultry surveillance where uh, every flock is uh, at least partially tested uh, we're, we're much more aggressive there than we are in this domestic swine so I would argue that a lot of that is superficial um, and really superficial, for instance, in China or in uh, Vietnam, where they have a lot of pigs. So I, I still think we can do better. I, I applaud that collaboration. I think there's a lot of concern in, in those editorials. We've talked about it, that work in the public health arena uh, threatens the industry because we might find something that suggests an occupational exposure and cost them, you know, dollars of uh, uh, business res rev revenue in the sense that there would be greater protection offered to the workers. And so there's concern and pushback. Um, and I've personally experienced it that the swine industry is not excited about working with public health officials. And that's too bad because I think uh, the viruses impact uh, pigs too. And like PED, one day there's going to be a virus that's going to cause a huge economic distress, I think, to the industry, an influenza A virus. And, um, you know, we, we just got to stay more on top of it, I think. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Um, we don't have any additional questions um, in the queue. Um, I will say that um, if additional questions arise, you may email them to us at ce at acbpm.org. That's charlie echo at acbpm.org. And we'll work to, with Dr. Gray to provide you with um, answers if, if something comes up after the fact. Um, 
Dr. Gray, is there anything you would like to say in conclusion? I, I guess I'd just like to thank uh, our veterinarians in preventive medicine uh, for doing all that you do to uh, protect uh, our animals, our, our food supply, our economies. I know it's not, it's not easy. Um, you know, in talking to a number of you, uh, there, there are great restrictions in your resources, um, but boy, I sure appreciate what you do, um, you know, and, and also what is done um, by FSIS in, in, in food production. Uh, and often I think people don't really um, honor, honor you for that, um, for those services. Thank you so much. Well, thank you again to Dr. Gray. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. The recording of this presentation will be uploaded to the American College of Preventive Med Veterinary Medicine YouTube page for future viewing um, in the near future. Um, and with that, I wish everyone a good afternoon. Thank you.